Good morning. So it's, it's my pleasure today to um, introduce Tom Gantz, who is the, the Clem Finch Visiting Professor. But before that, I'd like to introduce uh, Clem Finch. And I guess I should just, for the people that don't know me here, I'm Jan Apsowitz, I'm head of hematology, um, and uh, was actually Clem Finch's last fellow. So it's someone that I know quite well. And so Clem was head of the division of hematology from its start. He actually also wrote the history of the medical school when he retired, which is one of the first founders. Um, and uh, he was head remarkably for 32 years, which as a division head I find actually quite remarkable. Um, this is him in his earlier years when he became division head, which is another remarkable part of how, our, how what, at what age and who uh, developed medical school in the past. So he's made loads of contributions. He defined iron kinetics uh, and physiology. He studied uh, transferrin biology and predicted the existence of certain mediators, such as ferroportin, hepcidin, and erythroferone. And what's quite remarkable about the something visiting professor today is that he showed the molecular existence of these last two mediators that Clem predicted. And what Clem predicted would happen is exactly what was found when these molecules were molecularly identified. Uh, Clem also described red cell development and the physiology of anemia. He showed that hemochromatosis was due to the hyperabsorption of iron in the GI tract which was treated with phlebotomy. He defined better ways to store blood. And he helped the World Health Organization understand nutritional anemia in the developing world and championed the iron supplementation of food. And for that, he's had actually many contributions to nutrition and iron deficiency. He was a consultant who studied throughout the world, traveled extensively, which was also a hobby for him to many, many places. And it was hard to not find Clem without a Nepal vest on or a bow tie from somewhere um, because he was such a, an eclectic guy and traveler. And he was awarded the fifth annual Bar Bristol Myers Award for Distinguished Achievement in Nutrition. And this was a picture that came from that um, time and ceremony where he documented his work photographically uh, throughout the world. So my memories of Clem, he's very tall. Um, <laughs> he is very tall physically and he was very tall obviously intellectually. A very smart, very creative, excellent observer and listener, and therefore a really quite excellent bedside physician. Very eclectic in his interests and his skill set, and a very creative problem solver. So it's uh, fun today to have uh, Tom Gantz be the Clemson physical professor, because he shares all these characteristics except the very tall. <laughs> very tall, actually. what I can do. <laughs> but not, not physically, I can. Uh, but creative and smart and excellent observer and listening, eclectic in his interests, a good uh, world citizen, and a creative problem solver. Um, so uh, um, actually, uh, Tom was born in, in Czechoslovakia um, and came to the United States as, as an 18-year-old, went to UCLA uh, as an undergraduate where he um, graduated from Kumakunata in physics, went on to Caltech for a degree in applied physics, and then decided that medicine was really what he wanted to do. So he went back to UCLA to become a physician and then has stayed at UCLA for his training in pulmonary medicine. He's actually a pulmonary doctor, and Sheridan is a, um, a hematologist, um, and has been on the faculty there ever since, rising to a professor. He's had many um, awards. He's a member of AAP. He's won the Don Thomas Award from the um, American Society of Hematology. Um, and he's been a member of study section. He's 230 odd publications in many fields, usually relating to iron. And he got into the iron field because he identified Hepcidin as a uh, a defensive. And since then, he's really been a champion and a, and a leader in iron and hematology. And so it's a real pleasure to have him here today. Thank you very much. Well, it is a real pleasure to be here today um, and follow in the footsteps of Professor Finch, who really set the intellectual structure for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, was, uh, so essentially everything I'll tell you today was foreshadowed by his work with the possible infection, with the possible exception of the infection connection, iron and infection connection that I'll spend a few slides on. So other than that, um, I, uh, he was the one who essentially set the structure for my talk. Um, so, I'm going to start in a way that we used to start grand rounds. We used to have patients at grand rounds, and we would talk about clinical cases. So I'm going to tell you about a clinical case. 
So a 25-year-old man with abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, and symptoms and signs of heart failure presented to the emergency department. This was in Hungary. He was diagnosed as having um, fulminant congestive heart failure, had a myocardial biopsy, and on the biopsy, uh, large amounts of iron were seen. And here's a table uh, in which his iron parameters are compared to those of uh, compared to those of um, uh, his mother and brother. And I'm just going to point out that his transferrin saturation is 94 percent, whereas um, those uh, the transferrin saturation of his mother and brother are nor in the normal range, um, 20 to 45 percent. Uh, ferritin is 21,857 with a normal range of two, uh, 20 to 200. Um, and um, um, his uh, other interesting parameters is that he has evidence of liver damage and also of uh, hyperglycemia. He, his skin is darkly pigmented and uh, he had uh, arthropathy. Um, Two days after the diagnosis, he died from congestive heart failure. He was put on a transplant list. The heart was not available, and he died. And at autopsy, he had large amounts of iron in the heart, the liver, the pancreas, the lymph nodes, the testes, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. And in the testes, he had no mature spermatozoa. And his genetic defect uh, on, on, on gene sequencing was found to be a homozygous mutation in a gene called hemojuvalin. Um, or also HFE2. Um, if you carefully go into his history, you find that there were some problems before this happened. And he had, he didn't go through normal puberty. He clearly had an underlying endocrinopathy. But other than that, uh, he had a very fulminant terminal course uh, and was doing reasonably well with, uh, until about a week before this all happened. So this is an example of a situation in which iron is completely dysregulated, and we'll get into the molecular biology of that in subsequent slides. So what kind of iron disorders are there? So basically you can group them into two, two groups, too little iron and too much iron. Um, in iron deficiency, systemic iron deficiency, even before anemia develops, there is already evidence of impaired muscle function, um, exercise, impaired exercise tolerance, uh, work, impaired work performance, and then as iron deficiency progresses, um, you get frank anemia. Um, if um, mothers are severely iron deficient when they're pregnant, um, they're, the, feed, the children de may have developmental defects, growth retardation, and neurological deficits. If children um, are uh, severely iron deficient, they can also have growth retardation and neurological deficits. And finally, Iron doesn't just affect uh, the brain and the, um, and the muscles. Um, it also affects, um, uh, obviously, the, erith uh, the erythropoiesis. But also, um, you get epithelial changes because the regeneration of um, epithelia with high turnover is, uh, requires a fair amount of iron. So how is iron regulated? Too much and too, uh, too little is bad, so how is it kept in that sweet spot in the middle? So there are two, two different systems, and I will only speak about one of them today. Uh, there's systemic iron homeostasis, which is the regulation of the total con iron content of an organism through controlling iron absorption. And also, another control system, closely related to the first one, regulates the concentration of iron in extracellular fluid and the amount of um, uh, iron that's in storage in the liver. There's a separate system, and I will not have time to focus on that, in which each cell exposed to the sea of iron um, outside is regulating its um, own individual iron uptake and the subcellular distribution to the various organelles. So, how is iron moving around among tissues, uh, absorptive surfaces, and storage sites? So the, the average adult has something like four grams of iron, of which most at any given time is in hemoglobin of red cells. So 2.4 grams is in hemoglobin of red cells. Uh, as red cells outlive their 120 day or so lifespan, 
they're ingested by macrophages in the spleen and the liver, and the iron is recycled back into the plasma iron pool, from which it is uh, then um, uh, the iron moves into the bone marrow, where it is uh, taken up by erythroid precursors, and the cycle is basically restarted again. So iron moves from senescent red cells back to cells that are just being assembled and whose hemoglobin is being synthesized. So most iron is in this recycling circuit. Uh, about a gram in males and much less than that in females is in storage in the liver and in the spleen. And the system is so efficiently conserving of iron that only about one to two milligrams a day of iron are needed to replace the small losses through desquamation of cells from the body surfaces. Um, the sweet spot for iron is between 10 and 30 micromolar in, in extracellular fluid. So if chronically the concentration of iron is less than 10 micromolar, you get the expected cellular dysfunction and anemia. If it is chronically over 30 micromolar, uh, Transferrin is saturated with iron, and uh, the uh, non-transferrin-bound iron is taken up in various tissues where it causes uh, oxidative uh, and radical-mediated damage. So in humans in particular, um, the, the hemoglobin synthesis by um, erythroid precursors is highly dependent on recycled iron because uh, approximately 20 to 25 uh, milligrams per day of iron is recycled and only about one or two milligrams is, is absorbed from the diet. So most of the iron that is needed to make new red cells is recycled iron. That ratio is not exactly the same in every animal, so in mice it may be closer to 50-50, and, um, and so, but in humans it's, uh, it's completely a recycling economy, almost completely. So how is uh, the amount of iron in plasma regulated? So normally, um, or normally the um, plasma is supplied by iron through iron absorption, through iron recycling, and through removal of iron from storage. And the flows of iron from all of these places into plasma are subject to regulation. So if you, if you, for example, let me just go back to the previous slide, if you increase erythropoiesis, then the amount of iron that's flowing into, into plasma from stores, from recycled iron, and from the duodenum will increase to meet the needs of erythropoiesis. So, uh, for example, if you inject erythropoietin, the flows into, of iron into plasma will increase. The opposite of that takes place during inflammation. For reasons that I'll get into later, uh, in inflammatory diseases and during acute infection, the flow of iron into plasma is restricted to lower the concentration of extracellular iron. And this then, as a side effect of this host defense response, um, a common condition can develop, which is the anemia of inflammation or the anemia of chronic disease. So these two are two extreme examples of, um, of uh, uh, having to increase the amount of iron that goes into plasma versus having to throttle the amount of uh, iron that goes into plasma. So how does this all happen? Um, it's been about 15 or 16 years since uh, we accidentally discovered a peptide hormone that is uh, responsible for systemic iron regulation. And this is a peptide hormone akin to insulin. It's not exactly chemically uh, similar, but it is the, the, the same kind of concept. It is secreted by hepatocytes, and it regulates intestinal iron absorption and the distribution of iron to tissues. And here is a three-dimensional model of the molecule. It's sort of a bent hairpin, highly cross-linked by disulfide bridges. So, to demonstrate the, the, what hepcidin actually does, if we take 50 micrograms of hepcidin and inject it into mice, the concentration of iron in mice, which is slightly higher than in humans, uh, will drop from 30 micromolar or so to less than 10 micromolar within one hour. And the concentration will remain of iron in extracellular fluid 
will remain low for 24 hours before returning back towards normal. So this is very much akin to what would happen if you inject insulin into the mouse and look at glucose. So the relationship of hepcidin to iron is the same kind of relationship that um, an insulin has to glucose. So the receptor and target of hepcidin is an iron transporter ferroportin. Ferroportin is the only cellular iron exporter, so it's the only way that iron can get in significant quantities from cells into extracellular fluid and plasma. It is present in essentially all multicellular organisms, um, but it is only regulated by hepcidin in vertebrates. It is a member of the major facilitator superfamily that has members such as glucose transporters, amino acid transporters, and others. And we don't exactly know, although we're beginning to work on it, we don't yet know with any certainty what the mechanism of iron transport is, how iron is transported by ferroportin. So, most recently, one of our collaborators, um, uh, Mika Jurmaka, um, has actually uh, managed to crystallize a, a ferroportin homologue from a bacterium, from a bacterium that eats other bacteria. And this homologue is, uh, this bacterium is Velovibrio bacteria vores. And we, he managed to crystallize the molecule in both of its conformations. The, the uh, conformation which binds iron and is open up, uh, there is an open channel to the cytoplasm, and a second conformation in which the molecule flips open towards the extracellular fluid and releases the iron. So we believe that the mechanism of transport is this reciprocating pump um, kind of mechanism where iron enters the cleft um, and binds, flips the molecule to, to the other conformation and is released to the other side. Now, how does hepcidin fit into this? Well, according to our current models, hepcidin binds into the open out channel and when it binds, it induces the endocytosis of ferroportin. So here are cells, individual cells, where, in which ferroportin is tagged by GFP. And um, if you add hepcidin to these cells within one hour or so, um, the ferroportin is endocytosed and it ends up in lysosomes and is degraded. So this is essentially a, a receptor-mediated endocytosis of hepcidin that drives this system and it causes ferroportin to be lost from the surfaces of the cells, which then regulates iron transport by the following mechanism. If, if um, um, uh, the concentration of hepcidin in blood are low, intestinal cells will take up dietary iron from food, ferroportin levels on the surface of the cells will be high, and iron can be exported to blood and, and uh, uh, extracellular fluid. On the other hand, if concentrations of hepcidin are increased, hepcidin will bind to ferroportin, induce its endocytosis and destruction, and that cell can no longer transport iron from um, um, the dietary side, from the luminous side of the intestine, to the basal lateral side, and iron is no longer transported to blood plasma. And this exactly was predicted by some of Clem Finch's work, that there should be a transporter, a basal lateral transporter that behaves this way, and it turned out to be true. So where does the iron go when it cannot be delivered to plasma? It accumulates in ferritin in intestinal epithelial cells, and because intestinal epithelial cells are very short life cells, only they live about two days, the iron in ferritin is shed with the cells into the lumen and just flushed down the toilet. So what happens in the other important cell type that regulates iron uh, export to plasma, the macrophages? It's pretty much the same story, except instead of dietary iron, um, we are talking about erythrocyte uptake. So uh, what happens is the senescent erythrocytes are taken up by macrophages, they are digested, iron is released, and, um, and it is available for export to plasma if hepcidin is low. But if hepcidin is high, uh, ferroportin undergoes endocytosis, and the, the cell becomes unable to export the iron, 
And we deal with a situation which in the literature classically has been described as iron sequestration. The iron is trapped in ferritin of macrophages and it cannot be exported back into plasma. So then, the way this plays out then is that uh, if, we, if, uh, if we add hepcidin to a system, either through inducing its production or exogenous hepcidin, it will downregulate all of the major streams of iron into extracellular fluid and plasma. So it will downregulate iron absorption. It will downregulate the release of iron from stores. And it will downregulate the delivery of recycled iron into blood plasma. As a result of that, in the presence of hepcidin, the concentration of um, iron in plasma will decrease and less iron is available for erythropoiesis. So, as any self-respecting hormone um, would do, hepcidin is regulated by some, its substrate and it's also regulated by a number of other influences. The most important influences for hepcidin regulation are intracellular iron in the liver uh, and extracellular iron in blood plasma, especially transferrin associated iron. So those are the signals that induce the production of hepcidin, the blue arrows. Um, in addition, erythropoiesis affects uh, hepcidin in a way which I will get into in a few slides. And this is a suppressive effect. The more erythropoiesis, the more hepcidin is suppressed. Inflammation induces the production of hepcidin. So these are the ma three major influences, iron, erythropoiesis, and inflammation. So let's look at iron first. So we did an experiment, a series of experiments in which we uh, took normal volunteers and followed them for 48 hours. For the first 24 hours, we just measured their iron and hepcidin levels. And at time zero, in the middle of the course, we gave them a tablet of 65 milligrams of iron. Some of them would rapidly absorb the iron and raise their serum iron concentrations. Uh, in this case, this was a borderline iron deficient subject who absorbed a lot of the iron, doubled her uh, serum iron concentrations, and then these decay back towards normal. If you look at what hepcidin does, it follows the same time course with a delay of about six to eight hours. So uh, serum hepcidin is induced by iron in the same manner that insulin would be induced by a glucose tolerance test. So it's the same idea. How does this happen? This is very complicated. We could spend another hour just going through this, but we won't. So the the way that hepcidin is regulated, it is regulated through a bone morphogenetic protein pathway via the, this, this adapter series called the SMAD adapters, uh, which then increase the transcription of hepcidin. And the regulation, to, uh, to the best of our current knowledge, is entirely transcriptional. The BMP receptor does many other things in the body, and its function in this case is uh, is uh, modified for the purposes of iron regulation by a bunch of different adapters, um, including a specific bone morphogenetic protein, BMP6, and adapters uh, with names like hemojubilin, neogenin, and matriptase 2, which are uh, necessary for iron regulation. Now, none of these sense iron, as far as we can tell. So iron sensing occurs separately and involves transferrin receptors and an adapter molecule called HFE. These molecules collectively sense the levels of holotransferrin and somehow, and we are beginning to have some ideas about how that happens, interact with the BMP receptor complex to regulate hepcidin transcription. So this is an abbreviated version of, of how hepcidin is regulated by iron. The way we know this is that most of these molecules either are spontaneously uh, lost in human mutants, and that concerns AJ, uh, hemojubilin, transfer receptor 2, HFE, and the hepcidin gene itself, or have been knocked out in mice, so that we know that the loss of uh, any one of these molecules will affect um, iron metabolism. Most of the mutations in this system 
cause a syndrome called hereditary hemochromatosis in which excessive iron is absorbed, the total body iron content is greatly increased, and the iron is deposited in tissues that have the capacity to take up non-transferrin bound iron. And the chief among these tissues is the liver, the endocrine system, and the heart. Paradoxically, the spleen, which contains a lot of macrophages, is actually depleted of iron in, in this condition. So what is the molecular basis of this disease? As I already uh, hinted, this disease has uh, basically two forms. In one form, uh, hepcidin is deficient. The levels of hepcidin are lower than they should be, and this is equivalent to having diabetes mellitus from insulin deficiency. Um, in another group, much, much, much more rare, um, there is a, there's resistance to hepcidin at the level of ferroportin. Either the ferroportin doesn't bind hepcidin, or it binds hepcidin, but doesn't undergo normal endocytosis after hepcidin binding. And we know that because we have measured hepcidin levels in individuals affected by all the forms of hereditary hemochromatosis, as well as in individuals who have the resistant form of hereditary hemochromatosis, which is not shown on this slide. So in the resistant form, uh, hepcidin levels are very high, but hepcidin is entirely ineffective. In the more common deficient form, the uh, hepcidin levels are low, proportionate to the severity of the disease. So the gentleman whose story I presented you with had hemojubilin mutations, which leads to a very severe hepcidin deficiency. Uh, only topped by the deficiency induced by mutations in the hepcidin gene, gene itself. So the hereditary hemochromatosis is caused by the ablation of regulators of hepcidin or the hep hepcidin gene itself, which leads to absolute or relative hepcidin deficiency. It can also be caused by hepcidin resistance. The result of these uh, mutations is that Iron is hyperabsorbed, saturates plasma transferrin. Non-transferrin bound iron is then taken up by a variety of pathways which haven't been completely defined yet into organs where this particular process is not regulated, which then leads to um, overload of cells with non-transferrin bound iron and then toxicity from uh, uh, radical, reactive radical generation. So, when we began to understand how this all worked, we decided to uh, develop a strategy for replacing the missing hepcidin. And the hepcidin molecule itself is not a good candidate for drug. It's, a, it's difficult to make, it has uh, four disulfide bridges, it's uh, rapidly excreted through the kidney, it's, uh, it goes right through the glomerulus. Um, so, what we did is we analyzed the interaction of hepcidin with its receptor to try to find out what we need to make to induce endocytosis of ferroportin. So by mutagenesis of, of the ligand and the receptor, we arrived at um, the idea that the critical part of the hepcidin molecule is, are the first uh, nine amino acids. And we took the first nine amino acids and subjected them to uh, uh, trial and error evolution, where we replaced uh, uh, different amino acids by natural and unnatural analogs of those amino acids, and arrived at a series of mini hepcidins, so-called mini hepcidins, and this is an example of a mini hepcidin, 73rd in the series of mini hepcidins, which is, which is uh, composed of unnatural, many unnatural and some natural amino acids, and which is more potent than the hepcidin molecule itself in binding and inducing the endocytosis of ferroportin. So we then demonstrated in mice and, um, that if we take a mouse with hereditary hemochromatosis due to hepcidin deficiency, it will, uh, this black stuff here is iron, uh, the liver becomes iron overloaded in these mice, they don't have any hepcidin, they have hyperabsorbed iron, heart becomes iron overloaded, and the spleen becomes iron depleted, as, as, as does the duodenum, because the duodenum immediately transports the iron uh, for uptake um, in other tissues. 
Now, if you treat these mice with minihepcidin or preventively, uh, they will not um, deposit iron in the liver or the heart, and they will now develop the normal iron stores in the spleen, and they have some barrier, obviously, to iron absorption because now the iron uh, accumulates in uh, epithelial cells in the intestine. So this drug, in fact, um, this drug, in fact, is uh, being developed for uh, use in uh, human diseases, um, entered the human trials earlier this year, and um, it, the main target, interestingly, is not hereditary hemochromatosis, which is easily treated by bleeding, but another disease in which hepcidin is deficient, beta thalassemia. So in beta thalassemia, uh, normal erythroid development does not take place. What happens is that because of the imbalance in uh, globin gene synthesis, in this case, uh, deficiency of the beta globin gene, uh, alpha globin is synthesized in excess of beta globin, alpha globin precipitates and interrupts the normal differentiation sequence of red cells um, so that uh, there is a block to differentiation cells die before they become mature red cells. And um, this leads to a greatly expanded erythropoiesis at the earlier stages, but in a, it's ineffective in the sense that it doesn't produce very many red cells. These patients, paradoxically, uh, don't usually die of anemia, but they die of iron overload. Um, and they die of iron overload whether or not they receive transfusions. So even patients who never get any transfusions and have severe or moderately severe beta thalassemia will die of iron overload. So we uh, postulated that, and others postulated as well, that these precursors, as they expand and are stimulated by erythropoietin, secrete some suppressors of hepcidin. And in fact, we documented that patients with beta thalassemia have lower than normal levels of hepcidin, especially considering that they are iron overloaded. Um, so we, did, we used the mouse model of beta thalassemia in collaboration with uh, Stefano Rivella's group to show that treating mice with mini hepcidin not only prevents them from dying of iron overload, but it actually improves their erythropoiesis, which was a surprise. So here is a hemoglobin of a wild type mouse. Here is, a hemoglob here is the hemoglobin um, of a mouse which has this form of beta thalassemia. So instead of hemoglobin of 15, it now will have a hemoglobin of eight. This form would be called in humans thalassemia intermedia. And if we treat them with mini hepcidins, we can get anywhere between two and three grams of hemoglobin increase. And we can largely, but not completely, block the tendency of these mice to develop iron overload. So here is liver iron. Wild type liver iron is uh, low, but in thalassemic mice, it's many times greater. But if we treat them with mini hepcidin, we can at least half of the iron and uh, with some uh, titration of this drug, more than half, can, uh, can be uh, prevented from accumulating in the heart and in the liver of these mice. So, mini hepcidins are in human trials, and we will be giving them to patients with beta thalassemia to see if the mouse, pre mouse model actually is predictive of what happens in humans. So here, the question comes up, why are patients with beta thalassemia iron overloaded? And a broader question is, how does the body respond to hemorrhage? So if you take a human being and you bleed them, they will hyperabsorb iron. And how does that sequence actually play out at the molecular level? And why do patients with beta thalassemia uh, dysregulate uh, this or a related uh, regulatory cascade? So this is where I get back to Clem Finch again, uh, who in 1994, mostly from clinical observations and some measurements of iron absorption in humans, proposed that there is a connection between erythropoiesis and iron absorption, intestinal iron absorption. And he noticed that iron absorption is increased, especially in anemias with active erythropoiesis. It is increased by administration of erythropoietin, increased in untransfused beta thalassemia. And if patients with beta thalassemia are transfused, uh, absorption is decreased, and 
Not all forms of anemia increase iron absorption because it is decreased in aplastic anemia. So he argued that this factor, whatever it may be, must be made in the marrow. And we then showed in 2006 that if we bleed mice, they will suppress hepcidin. But if we bleed mice and kill their marrow at the same time, they will not suppress hepcidin. So anemia by itself requires an active erythropoietic response to suppress hepcidin. And here is an example of uh, how this regulatory sequence plays out when you give people erythropoietin. So here is a, a situation with five male volunteers who were given erythropoietin and we measured their hepcidin. Or this, in this case, Ashby and his colleagues measured their hepcidin. And what happens is within 24 hours or so, less than 24 hours after administration of erythropoietin, hepcidin dramatically decreases and stays down for several days. Uh, and it happens before there are any other changes in iron metabolism. So this is a, this is a response that is, is quite quick and is independent of what happens to iron. It causes the changes in iron. We also, as I mentioned to you before, we also measured uh, hepcidin levels in patients with thalassemia intermedia and showed that they were extremely low, despite the fact that patients with red plus thalassemia are iron overloaded severely in many cases. So what we undertook is a search for this factor, and the way we looked for this factor is that we would bleed mice or give them EPO, uh, and they appropriately suppress hepcidin when you do that. So here, is, here you bleed mice or give them erythropoietin, uh, they suppress hepcidin uh, with a, a minimum at 12 to 15 hours. And so what we argued is that we should really look for something that has the opposite time course and is made in the marrow. So we uh, did a, a, a genomic screen um, of transcripts that um, uh, are overexpressed in the marrow after hemorrhage or after erythropoietin administration. And the screen gave us a number of different proteins that changed, but only one of them encoded secre a secreted protein. And um, that uh, transcript we named erythroferone. It had been known in some other contexts. It was the systematic name for this uh, gene was FAM132B, but we named it erythroferone because we thought we had uh, the, the correct function for this protein. Uh, this is the, the anticipated structure of this protein. It's a member of the TNF alpha superfamily, um, and it is a 50 kilodalton glycoprotein, which is highly expressed in only in erythropoietin stimulated erythroblasts. So, if you administer erythropoietin and do a tissue screen, the highest expression you see is in the marrow and in mice, also in the spleen, uh, in erythropoietin stimulated erythroblasts. In fact, here is a, uh, the sequence of uh, uh, erythroferone induction after uh, the administration of er erythropoietin or after bleeding. And again, it's expected time profile uh, increases by four hours, reaches a maximum by nine to 12 hours, and then stays up. And we also showed that if we bleed uh, mice or humans, eventually we showed humans as well, that the levels of erythroferone in blood will increase with a maximum someplace between 12 and 24 hours. If, we, if the um, gene is knocked out in mice, they lose their hepcidin suppressive response to hemorrhage and erythropoietin. So this is the normal suppressive response of hepcidin after bleeding or after EPO. This is the heterozygote response and this is the response of the knockouts. They have a very little response to the bleeding or to EPO administration. And these mice also suffer a two, three day, two to three day delay in recovery from anemia induced by bleeding. We also showed that erythroferone will suppress the expression of hepcidin isolated hepatocytes. And if you inject it into mice, it will suppress hepcidin. It's a, it's a picomolar hormone. This is a dose response um, with, uh, with hepatocytes. It acts at picomolar concentrations. And so we propose that the way it works is that if you have anemia or hypoxia and stimulate the production of erythropoietin in the kidney, 
erythropoietin then acts on the marrow or in the mice also on the spleen. Um, and using the uh, EPO receptor JAK2 STAT5 pathway, it will then act on erythroblasts to increase uh, the production of erythroferone, which then suppresses hepcidin um, in, in production in the liver, which then releases iron for utilization by the marrow. So it increases iron absorption, it increases the release of iron from stores, and it makes adequate iron available for erythropoiesis in the marrow. So how does this all tie back together to the idea that the worst suppression of hepcidin is seen in ineffective erythropoiesis? So if this schema is correct, the more erythroblasts you have, and the higher the EPO stimulation, the more of this hormone will be made. So in patients with beta thalassemia who have massive hyperexpansion of erythroblasts in every bone in the body and high EPO, they will produce massive amounts of this new hormone. And that, in fact, turned out to be true, both in the mouse model and their red bars show age-dependent uh, comparison of wild type and thalassemic mice, and this is a QRT PCR, so this is an on a logarithmic scale, and there's an eightfold higher and tenfold higher level of erythroferone in wild type erythroferone mRNA in thalassemic mice than in wild type mice. Uh, in the spleen, the difference is even greater in mice. Um, if we um, look at serum concentration, um, the serum concentration of erythroferone is 20, 30 times higher in uh, thalassemic mice than in uh, the various controls that we use here. And if we ablate erythroferone in thalassemic mice, we can actually uh, res uh, restore hepcidin to normal levels and decrease their iron overload somewhat. In humans, interestingly enough, the discrepancy between normal levels of erythroferone and those that are seen in thalassemic patients is even greater. Uh, so with some thalassemic patients having 1,000 times higher levels of erythroferone than um, our mean normal controls. So then what we postulate then is erythroferone plus perhaps some other mediators are generated to excess in ineffective erythropoiesis they suppress hepcidin, and they essentially mimic the effects of hereditary hemochromatosis in that you get hyperabsorption of iron in the duodenum, um, saturation of, of, of transferrin with iron, and the deposition of non-transferrin bound iron in various uh, organs with attendant toxicity. So that takes me to perhaps the one subject that Clem Finch did not cover, which is this connection between um, iron and infection. Um, and so in some experiments in normal volunteers early on, we showed that if we take normal volunteers and inject them with lipopolysaccharide or interleukin-6, and this was done in countries where those kinds of things are routinely done, um, Denmark and the Netherlands, and um, what we measure, what what we uh, measured is the response to lipopolysaccharide or interleukin six, and both of these inject, both of these uh, stimuli, inflammatory stimuli, will cause um, hyperproduction of hepcidin within a few hours. And uh, this, these are this is three, uh, this is three hours uh, after end of infusion. This is two hours after the, so it's five hours after infusion. This is 24 hours after infusion. So we get a great increase of about eight to 10 fold of, um, of hepcidin in patients infused with IL-6. And the increase in patients in, uh, given lipopolysaccharide is, uh, is, is even greater. So inflammatory stimuli induce hepcidin. We now know that IL-6 is the dominant regulator of hepcidin in the inflammatory context and that um, and that um, IL-6 is required probably during most, most infections, at least in the mouse model, for the appropriate response to, um, appropriate iron response to infection and inflammation. So why 
Why does infection and inflammation induce hepcidin, and why does it cause the hypopheremia of infection and inflammation? Let me just go back to the previous slide. If you look at what happens to iron, the iron essentially is a mirror image of what happens to hepcidin. As hepcidin goes up, iron goes down. And this characteristic response, the anemia, sorry, the hypopheremia of inflammation and infection develops within a few hours of infection. So why is this? The routine answer to this is, well, bugs need iron, so the body downregulates the amount of iron. And that just didn't make any sense. And the reason that it doesn't make any sense is the bacteria have a lot of transporters for iron. And usually transporters work on a logarithmic scale. So it, concentration of iron that change by, changes by log makes a difference. But the concentration of iron changes by 50% or 70%. That doesn't make too much difference for a transporter. So, so the simple answer, it just lowers the amount of iron available to bacteria, is probably not not the right explanation. So we actually experiment, did some experiments on that. And we were guided by um, the medical journal called Orlando Sentinel, which um, reported that the 27th human infection in Florida was just confirmed in an elderly Jacksonville area man who was eaten by flesh-eating bacteria. He went out crabbing, was nicked on the skin by a crab, and within two days, he was dead of sepsis and this um, kind of a, uh, a necrotizing um, cellulitis that he had. And there's a number of these people. This happens every year in Florida, and there may be 30, 40 people who are affected by this. The agent is Vibrio vulnificus, and it preferentially attacks patients who have an iron disorder. And their iron disorder is either hereditary hemochromatosis, sometimes undiagnosed, or chronic liver disease that dysregulates the production of hepcidin and causes iron overload in a similar way. So we decided we would mimic that in mice. So we took mice who, that lacked hepcidin. But before we did that, we made sure that actually mice have a normal hepcidin, a normal response to this bug. So if we infect mice with very vulnificus, they in fact do develop hypopharemia. So their um, serum uh, iron level goes from 60 plus to, uh, less, uh, to around 30, so they get a 50% decrease in, in iron concentration, which is about what one expects. Um, but if you take hepcidin knockout mice, they have a minimal, if any, response. So we had a model, we, and we took the hepcidin knockout mice, and we infected them with Vibrio vulnificus, and lo and behold, at the doses that the wild-type mice completely survived, within 12 hours of infection, all the mice were dead. And um, if we then iron depleted the mice, we could prolong their life somewhat, but still, most of the mice would die, even if they are iron depleted, if they lack hepcidin. So what is the connection between hepcidin deficiency and this infection? Um, we took the mice, regardless of their iron status, and regardless of their iron status, whether they are low iron or high iron, we administered to them mini hepcidin, which lowers their serum iron concentration. So hepcidin knockout mice will maintain serum iron concentrations that are high, even in the face of iron depletion. But if we give them mini hepcidin, they will drop their iron to very low levels. So we took these mice, treated them with mini hepcidin, and we could essentially show that administration of mini hepcidin immediately before or even three hours after infection would essentially protect these mice from death. So if you do it in iron depleted hepcidin knockout mice, you can not, none of the mice died as opposed to the solvent treated ones. And if you do it in iron loaded mice, we can save, save most of the mice from death uh, due to sepsis. Uh, from this organism. So, so what is going on? In a more, in a more detailed series of experiments, we implicated non-transferrin bound iron as the cause of uh, of this uh, premature death of these mice from sepsis with Vibrio vulnificus. And the way this was done is we showed that these bacteria will grow very rapidly in the presence of non-transferrin bound iron, but will grow 
at a slow or it will not grow at all if we expose them to plasma that is not saturated with iron. So if you take normal plasma and keep adding iron, the bacteria will only start growing rapidly at the point at which you completely saturate transparent. So what we believe is the case is that hepcidin induction during infection prevents the release of iron from macrophages and prevents the saturation of transferrin that might occur when you have a lot of tissue necrosis because macrophages will have to clear up the cells, including red blood cells that are present in necrotic area. And in the process, they release massive amounts of iron. And in the absence of hepcidin, that iron would be dumped back into the circulation and would make more iron available in the form that this particular bacterium is looking for, which is non-transferrin bound iron. So we now think that the hypopheremia of infection is not about just lowering transferrin saturation. It's about preventing the production of non-transferrin bound iron. Side effect of this response is anemia of chronic disease. Because when you restrict the availability of iron, you are also restricting the availability of iron for hemoglobin synthesis. And uh, we now know that anemia of chronic disease or anemia of inflammation has a hepcidin-dependent component and a hepcidin-independent component. And again, we can clarify these issues in mice. So if we take hepcidin knockout mice or wild-type mice, and we treat them with a very inflammatory agent, which is heat kill brucella bordis, they will develop an anemia. Uh, so in the wild-type mice, they will um, go from a hemoglobin of 15 or so to a hemoglobin of uh, 7 in two weeks and then start slowly recovering. But if we knock out hepcidin, the nadir of this response is at hemoglobin of 10. And, and, and so at least something like uh, 40 to 50% of the anemia that you see in this very severe model is due to hepcidin. And in other models, the ratio may be different. Um, there are other effects that inflammation has. It shortens the uh, red cell lifespan. It, um, uh, suppresses erythropoiesis directly through the action of uh, action of various cytokines and erythroid precursors. So there are other effects of inflammation besides the hepcidin mediated effects, but a significant proportion is due to the effect on hepcidin. Uh, uh, is due to the effect of hepcidin. And in fact, if you look in patients with inflammatory diseases, hepcidin levels can be very high. This is uh, the normal range of hepcidin in volunteers. Uh, this is a range of hepcidin in patients who have various inflammatory diseases characterized by high C-reactive protein, and uh, the levels of hepcidin here are many times higher. In multiple myeloma, through a slightly different mechanism, um, and, uh, hepcidin is also increased. And in comparison, in comparably anemic patients with iron deficiency anemia, hepcidin is zero due to the appropriate physiological regulation of hepcidin. So, in fact, given the anemia of these patients, having this kind of sky-high hepcidin levels is uh, particularly uh, disruptive of normal erythropoiesis. So then the model that we proposed was that inflammation induces the production of hepcidin. Decreased renal clearance may also have some importance in chronic kidney disease, and that it, inhibits the flow of iron into blood plasma from its various sources, from iron absorption, from stores in the liver, from uh, recycled iron stored in the spleen. All of those flows are interrupted. Plasma iron is depleted, leading to hypopheremia of inflammation. And the decreased supply of iron to erythropoietic precursors inhibits erythropoiesis. And this is how decreased supply of iron inhibits erythropoiesis is, is another longer story, but it's an active process, and the erythroid cells are specifically sensitive to iron, the lowering the saturation of iron or the lowering the amount of holotransferrin that flows to the marrow, as opposed to other cells which are much less sensitive to the effect. So this then causes anemia. So what I told you today then is that um, the system of Iron homeostasis normally regulates the range of iron to, to be somewhere between 10 and 30 micromolar. But in two specific situations, which is increased erythropoiesis 
or whether it is effective or ineffective. And in fact, this, this homeostatic system is shifted either to produce less hepcidin in the case of increased erythropoiesis or to produce more hepcidin in the case of um, inflammation and infection. And we also touched on what the rationale behind these responses may be in the case of inflammation, that it is to prevent the production of non transferring bone iron. Now, I told you about Vibrio bulnificus, which is a bit of a special case, but we have expanded the kind of analysis, and it turns out that there are multiple organisms that have this kind of a response to non transferring bone iron, and they include some common pathogens like Klebsiella pneumoniae. So, um, the, the hypopheremic response is pro partially protective against infection uh, with Klebsiella pneumoniae, but it also has, makes no difference for a whole bunch of other pathogens that seem to be insensitive to non transferring bone iron. So, th there's still a lot of work to be done in sorting out which bacteria are affected, which bacteria are not affected, what is the, what is the logic of that particular dichotomy of the, some bacteria being insensitive to iron and others sensitive. On the erythropoietic front, um, um, just like we develop many hepcidins, there are drugs now being developed to either agonize or antagonize the effect of erythroferone. So uh, there will be drugs in that space to treat various anemias and to treat iron overload conditions. So I, again, to summarize, told you about hepcidin and ferroportin, told you about hereditary hemochromatosis and anemias with ineffective erythropoiesis, and then I didn't have time to talk about iron refractory, iron deficiency anemia, but I did talk about chronic disease, anemia of chronic disease and anemia of inflammation, and then touched on the issue of what is the purpose of the uh, hypopheremic response in inflammation. Just want to show the pictures of the people who significantly contributed to the work that I presented. Uh, Ellen Nemeth is my colleague and partner in, in this work. Um, Peter Luchala is the designer of mini hepcidins. Uh, Leon Kautz uh, discovered erythroferone. And Joan Rezesh um, worked on the Vibrio iron connection. And I thank you for your attention. Would ha be happy to take questions. Yes. Very much so. So the the, the milder the, the the longer it takes to the for iron overload to develop, if we measure hepcidin, hepcidin in those patients, they tend to have only a mild suppression of hepcidin, and. The, one of the things that I didn't have time to talk about is that the HFE mutation is very weakly penetrant, that most patients will in fact not develop disease because it's so mild, the effect is so mild. Second question is, we know that alcohol increases our iron absorption and people with iron overload are, are told not to drink any alcohol. Do we know the mechanism of that? There are some papers on the mechanism. We have not worked on that. Um, one of the papers suggests that it's mediated by um, uh, uh, that there is a another regulatory circuit with the most generation of reactive oxygen species um, that then regulate the STAT3, uh, stat that downregulate the STAT3 response. So the, it's the opposite of the inflammatory response, meaning that um, STAT3 mediated um, induction of hepcidin is disrupted by reactive oxygen species. Um, I, I don't think that this is settled. Thank you. Uh, what is the status of hepcidin assays for routine clinical use now? Um, so they, they are available from a CLIA approved lab. Uh, I can tell you the name separately because um, I, am, I started that company and I don't want to advertise it in a Grand Rounds forum. but. Um, the uh, uh, there is a lab that's a CLIA certified lab that can do it. You can send it out for that assay. Uh, 
it's going to go through an FDA approval and then it should be widely available. All right, we'll go ahead and close there, come down with any other questions. Thank you very much. Yeah.